Welcome to our session from Pavilion Data Systems on performance storage architectures for GPU computing. I am Costa Hassapopoulos, the Chief Field Technology Officer and Worldwide Vice President of Business Development for Pavilion Data. With me today is Jim Brennan, the Director of Systems Engineering, and Keith Ober, our Principal Architect for our Federal Division. What we're gonna cover in our session today is a few topics. The architectural trends and why they matter, some of the IO bottlenecks as it relates to parallel computing, some of the design decisions that you have to consider for GPU architectures, and a vision for the future on how innovation is closing some of the gaps in performance characteristics. As part of the session today, I will be the MC with Jim and Keith providing a lot of the color commentary. So as we start out our presentation, we're gonna talk about why NVIDIA and the GPUs are changing the world and this overall rise of GPU computing. On that topic, I'm gonna to turn it over to Keith Ober. Thank you, Costa. Today, I'd like to take a quick look at the trends that we're seeing in the marketplace. We know that NVIDIA is at an amazing pace of innovation, but how do we measure this? I'll be honest, in some ways, I think it's very difficult to measure but there are a few simple measurements that we can take a look at as a baseline. The first is Moore's Law, which coincidentally is named after Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel, which as we all know, Intel has been pushing the limits of Moore's Law for quite some time. But as you can see on the left-hand side, Moore's Law with, with a CPU-based computing seems to have really flattened off. And you see where uh, NVIDIA and the work that Jensen's team's been building has allowed the GPU architecture can continue to drive Moore's Law to new heights. A recent Wall Street journalist, Christopher Mims, describes how silicon chips and the power of artificial intelligence is more than doubling in performance every two years. Christopher cites that in a combination of hardware and software, uh, we're achieving these goals, which I agree with is enabling everything from autonomous cars, ships, facial recognition, to object tracking and identification, and last but not least, signal processing. This is significant when you stop to think about the implications of this technology. To go a bit deeper into the hardware, I'd like to introduce Jim. Thank you, Keith. And I'd like to start by kind of providing a quick overview. Uh, starting with this figure, many of you will be very familiar with it because it's straight from the NVIDIA CUDA programmer's guide. Uh, it's a very popular figure that's used in many technical engineering papers and just around the community. And it essentially shows a high level view of both the CPU and the GPU architecture side by side. And uh, there's a lot of elements missing and so forth. But again, this is very high level. And the thing that I'd like to stress is just a comparison of what, what's colored green here, which, is, which are the ALUs, the arithmetic logic units, which are really what performs the number crunching, all the computations that advance the code. And if you look at the ratio of green on the CPU versus the GPU, you will understand why GPUs are able to, to perform so many more operations than a GPU, than a CPU. Now, in my opinion, this doesn't mean that we're someday going to be replacing all CPUs with GPUs because they're different tools and they perform a different job. And depending on the job that we're doing, we need to use the right tool. So, we're, we're going to be talking about architecture of storage systems to be able to feed these processors. And I'll just use one simple metric. And I know that it's potentially not the best, but it's simple to understand and the specs are out there. So I'm going to focus on the memory system on the DRAM. So if you look at, if you look at the CPU traditionally, I mean, kind of the, the state of the art, the next generation is the DDR5 memory which on a per package basis can deliver about 50 gigabytes per second. And if you look at the current architecture of the A100 GPU, it uses HBM2, which theoretically has a bandwidth of 256 gigabytes. So that's roughly a 5X difference. And, and I'm going to use that as kind of the basis for IO. Again, this is not a scientific or engineering metric by any measure, but I think it, it gives us an idea of, of kind of the amount of bandwidth that's required to keep these two different processors busy. So I'd like to start with a quote. This quote was, came out about a couple, of, a couple of decades ago. And if you're not familiar with Kent Batchelor, he was a renowned computer scientist focused particularly on parallel computing. And he said this 
tongue in cheek, kind of half jokingly. But you know what? It was true then, and it was true today. In the spirit of what Professor Bratcher has said, we have effectively moved this bottleneck around, and the bottleneck now is in the I.O. area. You know, Jim, what are some of the architectures that are helping to address this bottleneck, and what are some of the things we can do to, you know, fix this problem? Well, that's a really good point, Costa, because um, there's been a step function. As Keith was talking about and showed on the, on the diagram, there's been a step function in terms of the increase in performance uh, in computing introduced by GPUs. And therefore, there needs to be a step function uh, equivalently uh, from the storage system, which feeds the data into the GPU system. So if we look specifically in detail at the complete architecture of, of GPU computing, um, and this isn't anything sophisticated, but it's looking at it more from a, from a traditional uh, systems engineering uh, perspective. If we look at specifically the, you know, a, a typical GPU system, uh, computing system where you have the computing layer, the IO layer, the storage layer, I mean, very simple, but we can abstract that IO layer, which comprises some of the memory subsystems of the GPU, as well as the network. And let's assume uh, that, that, that the bandwidth is there. So the connectivity between the GPU and the storage is there, there's sufficient bandwidth. And all we need are the computing cycles from the GPU and the storage engine or, or storage system in the, uh, in the storage layer. And um, if we look at the, if, at the GPU, again, we're, we're talking about parallel computing uh, as opposed to serial, more, more of a serialized computing process on the, on the CPUs as we discussed in the previous slide. And, and then we have the IO layer, which is parallel. Again, the, the memory systems, the, the caches and everything certainly have high bandwidth and, and are considered parallel. But if we talk about the storage layers, uh, it's composed of two main elements. The storage interface, which varies depending on whether you're using block or file or object-based storage, and, and the storage system itself. And so doesn't it make sense that if the computing layer is highly parallel with the GPUs, shouldn't the storage layer be equally designed to be parallel? Thanks, Jim. That's a, a good lead into this whole hyper-parallelism. One of the things that we're seeing out there is really looking at this whole stack from the GPUs to the software to the data to the applications, right? Really need to look at and really evaluate that whole stack because the GPUs are massively parallel and the software is leveraging that parallelism. But is the data, that data layer really mirroring that parallelism and really feeding that I'll call it feeding the beast of all these GPUs and the applications above that. So I think what people are out there now today are looking at is how do you evaluate this overall stack? And there's many different options that people are doing today and many different architectures. So maybe Keith, you could uh, explain a few of the architectures that we see in the data world today that is again, how to use that word feeding the beast of these AI, HPC, you know, machine learning type solutions that are out there. I, I completely agree with you. There's a lot of innovation happening in this space, and there's a lot of choices uh, when you're architecting these systems that you have to take into account. Um, and, and I've broken them down into four main uh, architectures. Um, obviously, there may be more in this design, but uh, I'd like to speak to these four as a starting point. And, and Costa and, and, and Jim, feel free to jump in as we're, we're walking through this, because I, I think there's a, a lot of people that are, are looking at these architectures and they've chosen one or the other. But, you know, I think it's important for application developers and, and people, data scientists looking to leverage these architectures, that they really need to think about uh, not only the logarithms that they're leveraging, the frameworks that they're using, but they, they have the NVIDIA GPU power they also need to think about the entire stack. And here's how things break out. Starting with uh, the parallel file system. This is what you typically see in high performance computing architectures. There's a reason they've gone down this path. Partly it's because of the parallel performance. And it seems like that'd be a great fit for your GPU workloads. Um, it has high throughput capabilities, uh, even to a single system, You know, be that a DGX1, maybe a DGX2, DGX A100. They have the ability to drive low latency network infrastructure. You know, a lot of these architectures today are based around EDR and Finiban. Um, and these architectures are moving very quickly to HDR for the next generation designs. Again, this matches very closely with what NVIDIA's launched with the DGX A100, which has uh, several HDR ports built into the architecture. 
these architectures can also stream massive amounts of data. The next simple shared architecture I, I, is really around the network file system. And uh, there's some very key fundamental options here. Uh, you know, the simplicity of it, it you know, uh, NFS has been around for a long time. It's, it's built into every Linux system uh, that's out there on the market today. Uh, it's low cost. It, it's all ethernet based. So depending on your application stack, this might be the right choice uh, when you're developing things where you've got data transitioning in and out of the cloud, or you're, you've got an array of sensors, uh, IoT of things, collecting data. You know, a lot of that architecture looks like and feels like an ethernet architecture pulling that data in. There's also uh, a local data architecture. And this, this is kind of an interesting space. You know, this is one that uh, is near and dear to my heart. This is, a, again, a very simple design, uh, maybe even the easiest design really of, of the four that are here. It, it delivers high throughput, extremely low latency. Uh, this is use cases where I think people are doing real time or near real time processing of data that they're collecting and, and, and looking at. The last one I'll mention is really around object storage capabilities. And this I'll say is more of an emerging market where uh, I've talked to folks who have a, a lot of data being collected in the cloud and, and the data is processed in the cloud but at some point they want a, a subset of that data. Maybe they want a, an enclave of data on premise that they can sift through that data, leveraging the DGX GPUs and they, they wanna keep it in the same format. Uh, they wanna keep the object format where they might have custom metadata. Uh, they wanna simplify their data curation and things of that nature. And they also like the advantage of the, the data resiliency and the data security. So those are just kind of the four high level architectures that I run into uh, day in and day out uh, as people make these design choices. Keith, good overview of the various options. I'm sure there's lots of pros and cons of each one of those architectures. So uh, I think we're gonna drill into each one of those. And Jim, can you give us a little color around the HPC parallel file system, some of the pros and cons and some of the innovative things people are doing in that space? Yes, Costa. So let's start with the uh, HPC and as we describe them, parallel file systems. And just to be clear, this is both parallel and distributed, and there is a difference, and users of these file systems know what that difference is. So what are the advantages? Well, first of all, they have parallel performance and as well as they're distributed, meaning that it's not a single storage device. You have different devices actually providing I.O. You, you, you break out the metadata of the file system, which is typically the biggest uh, bottleneck. Um, the data about the data, meaning you know all, all the information that's in the inodes. When you're doing thousands or millions of transactions per second, that IO data, which is are small packets, uh, can actually raise havoc and actually slow down the performance of the system. So the ability to, to, to break out both the, both the IO, uh, meaning the data, as well as the metadata, really increases the, the throughput and the performance of the system. These type of file systems can be used both for high throughput of a single client, meaning you can use it to, to stream data, uh, like in the case of a visualization system where you're doing, or any type of real-time system for that matter, where you need high throughput, low latency on, on a small number of clients. It doesn't even have to be a single client, but a smaller number of clients, uh, probably maybe 10, maybe at the, at the most, probably 20 is on the high end. As opposed to high throughput, where you have thousands of processors like you might have in a cluster, and you need to you need to feed all of them uh, continuously, and and in many cases this is low latency because of some of the protocols that you're running across the file system. Some of the communication, uh, like like MPI is one of the pro, uh, one of the uh, popular protocols to do that. Uh, the other part is uh, built-in streaming of HPC data, and this is becoming increasingly important, especially with the with IoT. I, and all there's, we expect to have about 40 billion, I believe is the number by 2025 uh, IoT devices out there on the network. And each one of these is gonna have, you know, on average three to five different sensors collecting that data, potentially pre-processing it, and then sending it to something like a, like a GPU computing system to actually do, do the heavy lifting on the computing side. Uh, some of it will be AI, a lot of it will be AI, but not all of it. So again, a lot of streaming data that needs to be processed in real time. So these are the advantages. That's what these types of file systems are built for. But what are the challenges? 
they are complex because they have a lot of moving parts. Uh, some of the systems uh, are very flexible and they can be put together uh, such as, and I mean, I'll just mention here, Spectrum Strail, uh, GPFS as it's more commonly known, uh, has been around for a while, but it can be used in many ways and many configurations. And in order to understand which parts of it you need, uh, requires a, a fair amount of understanding of not just the, the file system itself, but, the, but the, uh, the problem that you're trying to challenge, uh, that you're trying to solve, and some of the uh, IO challenges within it. Uh, some of these file systems are proprietary, so they, they require licensing. And if you have thousands of nodes on a cluster, well, the, it, it mounts. In addition, there's also cost on the back end, uh, meaning the actual storage system that, that's required to be able to maintain performance on the file system. Uh, and traditionally we've used, uh, you know, for the past few decades, we've used spinning disk and spinning disk has worked well for us. But one of the challenges with spinning disk has always been that we always have to add additional capacity to get the performance that we need and that incurs higher costs. Uh, another, and I'll, I'll touch upon random access patterns, but what, what that essentially means is that even if you have uh, what we consider more like sequential access to the storage, but you have enough streams of it to a storage system, it literally looks like random access. And spinning disk in particular is, is not very good at handling random access. As a matter of fact, in many cases, in real time cases, we have to do a lot of work to, to make that to, to make the access to the disk drive sequential. And, and finally, the massive data foot uh, in terms of, you know, it's a complex system, it needs to be broken out. So we need additional networking, we need additional storage systems, and, and all of that adds, adds footprint. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you, Jim. I, I'm curious, as we talk to customers and the innovative solutions that are out there, um, what are ways that uh, companies are reducing the complexity for these architectures? Well, one of the, one of the key um, innovations that's occurred is the introduction of flash storage. Uh, as an architect, I like to look at, at, at tools that I, that I build an architecture with it, component, building blocks, whatever you want to call them. And flash storage is incredibly powerful. Uh, it has its limitations like every single building block has, but it's one of the things that we can really use to reduce complexity because of the performance and particularly the low latency. I found that latency is one of the one of the things that as as it starts building up and it does, it's one of those uh, things that accumulates through the system, and it usually starts at the at the storage device itself, and in the past it started at the disk drive, and so flash drives have much lower latency, and so you have a lot of headroom as you build that system that I was talking about. But I think that that's one of the things that's really going to help in terms of reducing the complexity, as well as the cost, as well as shrinking the, the footprint. Well, you made a good point, Jim. So the, the, the latency, it, you know, I, I've, I've talked to, to customers in the field as well about this latency problem. And if you think about it, it's kind of like a growing tidal wave. If, you, if you're introducing latency to each one of these GPU cores, uh, at the end of the day, you could have this massive tidal wave of latency that's impacting your processing. And the thing about latency is, um, a good example for latency is any real-time process, but let's talk about you know, visual computing and particularly like, like video. If you look uh, at an industry like media and entertainment where they're literally uh, playing out files, for instance, just, just in play out, they're taking files uh, assuming they're already rendered, just an image, and you're basically displaying these images. And sometimes you're, you're putting out an image that's maybe four, six, eight megabytes in size, and you want to put it out as high as maybe 120 of those images per second. So uh, you have only have a few milliseconds literally to load that image and, and process it and, and run it through the display system, which is kind of the origin of how GPU started in the first place. And so if you miss that window in a real time system, it's not like you're going to catch up. You're not going to, you know, a few seconds later display an image that was supposed to be displayed, you know, 10 seconds ago. That makes no sense. And, and most of the time you don't even have the performance to do that. So yeah. it's, it's very important in real time systems to the, the, the latency and, and literally they're driven by that. And, and, and developers of the software are constantly trying to uh, optimize the workload as to the amount of work that gets done and being able to do it in parallel 
if the problem can be parallelized, because all of this assumes that we're talking about an application that, that can be parallelized. And so um, it, it can be done in some cases. In other cases, the level of effort that it takes to, to parallelize it is not worth it, or it just simply can't be done because of the synchronization that you need between, between the different streams in the parallelism. Thanks, Jim and Keith. Sounds like uh, the external file system can be very valuable and very powerful and really to and really enable that parallelism and efficiencies, right? But, you know, as we know, there's all sorts of trade-offs, as you know, this things can be very powerful and can enable this huge parallels, parallelism, but, you know, they can be expensive and maybe sometimes hard to maintain, right? Um, so another option I think that's out there uh, is that is to enable that parallelism but typically is a little simpler to deploy, but from my understanding, is more of a shared data network, shared data system, you know, a network file system like NFS. You know, Keith, can you maybe provide some uh, color commentary on the pros and cons of, you know, parallelism in that space? Thank you, Costa. Uh, I'd like to dive into network file systems for a minute. So, you know, as Costa and, and, and Jim were explaining, there's some inherent advantages with this architecture. Uh, the simplicity, I, I think, is paramount. Uh, it's typically, you know, it's found on every Red Hat Linux distro out there. Uh, you, you name the Linux distro, you can run it. It's been around for, for many years. So everyone is very familiar with it. And a lot of times when, when I'm talking to uh, customers in the field uh, and they're looking for a way to integrate uh, into their AI pipelines, they've got a data set that they, uh, they've been collecting data for a long time and they'd like to pipe this into something like a, a DGX architecture or a GPU enabled architecture from NVIDIA. And it, it is the, the easiest answer for getting data in and out of that system that's shared with uh, an x86 stack that might, might process the, the, the pre-AI uh, training models. These same advantages for an NFS file system are true today with uh, GPU enabled applications. That's not to say they don't run into some challenges. These NFS architectures are often limited on throughput and it's not necessary, depending on the architecture, you know, there are some, some innovation happening in this space where they've, they've taken this architecture and, and there are scale out designs for NFS. But as you do this, if you look at the details, you know, and I would, I would challenge, you know, customers that are out there, what is my maximum throughput single client uh, to your NFS architecture, because you may find that somebody threw out, hey, I can do tens of gigabytes per second potentially for NFS workloads. But when you go and drill into the details, you know, maybe that ingest speed is really in megabytes instead of gigabytes, or, or the uh, read performance, it maxes out at one gigabyte, even though they're touting a much larger number. A an additional challenge in the space is really around latency. You know, uh, in, in some of these architectures, the DGX platform, a lot of these architectures are plugged into uh, an InfiniBand network with EDR 100 gig Ethernet or EDR InfiniBand networking. And if you're going down the path of uh, InfiniBand, uh, the, the NFS file server is likely sitting on the other side of a, a network bridge. And so between your GPUs, as, as Jim showed us early on, he had the stack of all this uh, parallelism coming down through GPU cores to the, to the uh, L2 cache, to the RAM, and then out to uh, uh, the network storage interfaces. You know, when you're talking about NFS, you might be adding in multiple hops in order to take this architecture that's worked very well in the past and apply it to your new AI workloads. And, and you know, potentially, uh, you, you folks in the field, uh, you may have already hit this, or maybe it's something that you see on the horizon as a challenge that you're going to have to face. I don't think there's anything wrong with the NFS architecture. I just think that it's something that, depending on your workload, you're going to run into it, and, and you may have to make some, some compromises. And, you know, the, the, the danger is that you've got GPUs sitting there waiting on, pro waiting on the data before they can process the next step. Um, and this, this, this could be impeding some of your workloads. The last point I'll make here on, on some of the challenges with this architecture is around scaling. You know, as you scale this out, are, are you going for a, a bulk storage play? Um, how big is your data set? Because, you know, as we talk to folks, a lot of my conversations have transitioned from, hey, I have 10, 20, 30 terabytes of data to I have a couple hundred terabytes of data and I'm going into petabytes or multiple petabytes of data 
for my processing. I think this is kind of the, the, the crawl, walk, run strategy. And I find a lot of folks in the crawl, walk stage, and they're starting to recognize that uh, their current NFS stru structure may not be sufficient for their walking and running phases in their design. So in the innovative solutions, I think there are ways to reduce this latency. Um, and you know, I'll touch on this. There are, there are some, some interesting things customers are talking with us about. Um, you know, this is one of those areas where I'd say, you know, reach out and we can, we can talk to this a little bit. Um, and there's also things happening on, the, on this space where uh, you know, traditional NASs and NF network file systems are typically talking in you know, 10 gigabyte per uh, uplinks, you know, very small network uplinks because the network file systems were never really designed to be uh, high performance. You know, they, you know, a couple years ago, we weren't really talking about uh, DGXs being connected to um, you know, these network file systems. So there's a new paradigm that people need to start to think about if they're trying to feed uh, GPU workloads with a network file systems. Jim, do you have any thoughts on this architecture? I do, Keith. And um, I think that anybody who's ever managed a system, I mean, you know, not only understands uh, a protocol like NFS, but also loves it because it's simple. It's already installed. Um, all the packages are there and so forth. Uh, it's easy to understand how it works. However, it does have some scalability issues. And there are some good, so there's some very good systems out there in terms of that have, you know, scaled out NFS via, via clustering and so forth. And as a matter of fact, uh, the need for it is reflected by NFS itself offering uh, parallel NFS, uh, NFS 4.1. So uh, th the need is there, and I think it shows people you know, like it and, and want to use it. But there comes a point where you, you just surpass the performance of where NFS can go. And hopefully, uh, NFS will continue to progress and expand and innovate. Uh, but I think it's facing a couple of issues. One of them is that it's a, it's a standard and it's a very popular standard. It would be like trying to replace all the ethernet out there. It would have to be backward compatible. And if you've ever worked on any standards committee, which I've had the opportunity to do it once or twice, uh, it's a very long involved process. Um, and, and a lot of problems have to be addressed. So uh, I, I don't know if it's going to get there fast enough because things are just progressing very fast in terms of the demands. Uh, but I think that, that NFS will always have a, a, a place in the, in the solution stack. And depending on the type of problem you're gonna solve, and, and as you mentioned, here we go back to talking about latency, depending on the latency that you need, NFS may or may not you know, you fit your needs. Yeah, you made a, make a, a good point there. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't mean to lay this out as it's one or the other, I think it's interesting that you know, for some of these workflows, it may make sense uh, for architects and people looking to maximize performance to think about maybe, maybe there's a use case for the, the parallel file system for some workloads. Um, and maybe in a different use case, a, a network file system might be ideal for some of the workflows and the data processing. So I think this is where evaluating the performance that you need, but recognizing that there are, are alternatives that may solve the problem that you're facing now. Yeah, I think you're 100% right there because, for instance, if you look at the parallel file systems we just talked about, uh, they very often, if not, maybe not all the time, but very often they'll have a gateway or, or a bridge so, they're, so you can actually connect uh, some clients via NFS. You're not going to get the performance, but you still have access to the same data as, as the cluster might have. So uh, in terms of using you know, multiple, multiple file systems, uh, multiple protocols. Um, it, 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 really, it really brings up a subject that's really important, uh, which uh, I've been thinking about a lot, is we really need, flexibility has always been important. The ability to adapt to change has always been important. But just in, 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 in the last five years, 10 years, things have been changing so rapidly. And if we look at even this year, you know, with, 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 with the pandemic, with the COVID pandemic, uh, being able to adapt to, to change is, is really important. So having flexibility uh, in all of these layers, in the compute, in the, in the network layer, you know, all the IO, in the file system, and at the storage uh, layer, which in the past, that's, that hasn't had a lot of flexibility. I think that that's really important. Well, and, and you make a, an, another great point is, you know, the, the flexibility is key 
and, and I liked what uh, Costa talked about early on in our, in our talk. Um, you know, it's paralyzing the hardware uh, at the GPU level. It's paralyzing the, the software stack because, you know, one way that folks can take advantage of NFS and extend the use of it is if their workflow leverages prefetch and they're doing a good job at prefetch um, and it's not a lot of random access um, and you have some idea of what data you want to pull in next, you know, the latency may not be a, a big challenge and network file systems, as long as they can deliver the throughput uh, quickly enough um, and with, you know, just enough latency, you know, the prefetch may be a way to uh, continue to leverage uh, network file systems. And that's really at the software stack. Thanks guys. You know, the shared file systems are seem to be a very powerful product and very simple to use. And of course they do have some trade-offs. So, you know, thank you for that information. You know, I believe there's a next area, you know, called local storage where the storage is physically inside the DGX or the GPU enabled server. And there's some benefits of that. And of course, some trade-offs. Um, Keith, you know, and with Jim, a little color, right? Can you provide a little insight on that area? Sure, Costa, happy to do that. Um, this, this is an interesting area. Uh, you know, I didn't really expect to, to have to dive into, uh, you know, direct attached storage. Um, this, is, this is an area where, uh, you know, I, I explained a little bit ago about the, the crawl, walk, run use cases. This is coming up uh, time and time again now with customers that, that started with a really small project, you know, maybe a pilot program. And uh, they recognize that to get to the next level, they need to start thinking outside the box as to how to solve this. You know, there's, there's several simple advantages to this design though. Uh, obviously it's the simplest of the, the designs that you can start with, uh, has massive amounts of throughput, it's very low latency, um, and it's ideal for real time, near real time workloads. Uh, processing of signal collection, you know, a, a, you, know you might have a, a camera, you know, connected to a scientific instrument. Um, you might have uh, a sensor of various use cases. Being able to bring that data in, and, and I think of kind of a pathology use case where maybe you wanna visualize that data, process through that data very quickly. Uh, the challenge is though, as, as you look at the, the cameras and things like that, they continue to progress and, and pull in larger and larger amounts of data. So the need and the challenge that very quickly arises, uh, again, in that, in that crawl to walk phase, a lot of people are running into the challenge of, I've got a limited capacity um, and how do I scale this architecture? You know, if, if I go the path of a network file system, uh, I'm not gonna get the same performance that I had with the real time or near real time workloads. Uh, I'm also faced with the challenge of, you know, I, I don't, don't necessarily want the complexity that would go into a, a parallel file system to solve this problem. Um, and, you know, we, we've talked about this before, Jim, you and I, where we, we've talked to folks in the past, in past lives, where they had these DAS-like architectures, where if somebody wanted to add um, compute, uh, they had to also incorporate storage in that design. Um, the same was true if they needed more compute, then they had to also add more storage at the same time. And this is something that, um, you know, a large, large storage architectures have have broken this out in a shared storage architecture where you share uh, uh, the, the backend block storage it is a great way to solve this particular challenge. It, it actually opens up a great deal of flexibility to your end customer, to the application stack that's, that's up, up uh, above this. And there's ways to get linear scaling. Now the challenge that most people run into is how do you get a shared architecture to deliver the performance that you would uh, assume you'd only see in local drives. And that's some of the secrets uh, that, that we've been working on, that we've been talking to customers on, is that extending this technology where you get extremely low latency, high throughput, this is a way to solve this. And we've actually gone down the path of, of I, I've talked to some folks where, you know, you could directly attach the storage to a DGX1, potentially push the limits of what previously was, was possible. Jim, any thoughts on this architecture or, or things you'd like to share here? Um, I think the epitome of, of the challenges with local attached storage comes with real-time processes. So whether you're talking about something like doing a, a fly-through through a very large seismic data set that you've processed, uh, and you've got terabytes and terabytes of data, and you've got your visualization system, and you know you have a uh, seismologist or a geologist looking at the data, and they want to literally fl fly through the data and look at faults or whatnot, 
Um, or for instance, another example is I was talking about play out of, of frames, you know, in the media and entertainment industry. Uh, often there's a dedicated system with local attached storage because of the performance low latency requirements of, of you know, this type of operation. Uh, however, that data sometimes has to be computed, modified, accessed by, by, by the applications that actually generate it. And in many cases, sometimes it's one of two things. You either have a dedicated system to do that, or you basically kick everybody off of the shared system so that you basically have, you're the only one that has access when you're doing these operations. Uh, well, neither one of those solutions is actually practical. So ideally, you would have a, a shared storage system that could actually deliver the performance to, to operate both, to perform both of these operations simultaneously. And obviously within, within some constraints, but certainly not turn in a shared file system into a single user just because you need the performance of the whole file system. So sharing is, is a major component of that flexibility we've been talking about. Well, in, in, in tying off of that, um, you know, when you think about it, it's, it's not only the flexibility that's there, but it's also the density. So I, I've talked to people that have uh, particular workflows. Um, they're scanning through certain data sets, maybe in the scientific realm where, um, you know, the data is only, you know, they, they don't want to store all of the data that they're collecting. Uh, they, they may want to save just a subset of the data as they're scanning through the images and, and pull out really the interesting things. But uh, the ability to scan through a massive amount of data and, and then keep going uh, is, is really interesting to folks. And these data sets, they're looking at uh, upwards of a couple hundred terabytes locally attached to these systems. And, you know, there are ways to solve this where you could have a petabyte in a very small footprint attached directly to a DGX. Again, this is kind of the sensor workflow uh, use case. And it's, it's, it's really interesting in um, the federal space where a lot of people are doing research and they need something along these lines to process this. This also opens the avenue of, of near real time or real time processing for things like cyber data. Um, I, I think there's a, a very interesting uh, way that this could be adapted as a model for, for people that really only um, need, need huge amounts of capacity, but for a limited amount of time. And, and we're partnering, we're partnering with folks that are also looking at uh, new application stacks where they're, they're leveraging things like the GPUs to run an all new application stack that you know, maybe database driven and, and things of that nature where they need the performance, um, not necessarily as much about the throughput, but about the latency. And, you know, a, a locally attached architecture will give you the maximum amount of uh, read, write, and latency architecture that you can possibly get. Um, and so for some of these applications, you know, N NVIDIA continues to, to push higher and higher amounts of GPU computing power into the market there have to be ways to solve this. And, uh, you know, we're certainly, we believe we're on the cusp of, of really helping customers uh, dive into that, that kind of space. So it's, it's a fun area to talk about. Thanks guys. You know, the simplicity of local storage or that direct attach with the storage physically in, inside that GPU based system is actually very interesting, right? Especially when you can, you know, leverage some modern technologies like NVMe and NVMe or Fabric been able to, to scale that storage outside the box, you know, leveraging RDMA, you know, I think, and sometimes I think, you know, we've seen in solutions out there that you can, you know, really use a shared block storage array to extend the capacity of that single uh, uh, GPU enabled server storage. So options are really great there. And I think we'll talk about more of those as we summarize, you know, the last area in our parallelism of data for this call it again, feeding the beast, right, is the last area is object storage, right? Keith, you know, you know, what are you hearing out there so far? You know, there's some interest in object storage in this space. I don't know, it may not be mainstream today, but I believe there's a lot of momentum out there to leverage object storage and what the capabilities of that are. Can you give us a little color on that? Absolutely, Costa. Um, you know, this is one that I've, I've, I've worked for uh, tech startups that have done hybrid cloud technologies that have integrated with uh, various cloud providers from Microsoft, Google to Amazon. You know, I, I think there are a ton of advantages when it comes to cloud native. Uh, they, they have the, the massive amount of scaling. Um, if you think about IoT and the, the data that's being pumped into the cloud, that's being collected uh, from mobile devices and everything that's out there, uh, 
Um, there's a, a ton of great benefits for these architects, including things like custom metadata tagging, um, the data security with multi-factor authentication, all of these things, I think, play to the strengths of object storage. Uh, a, a lot of this data has been collected in, in some form or fashion to one of these cloud providers. And a subset of that data is interesting for uh, researchers, maybe to go back and analyze, or you know, you, you think of the COVID um, data tracking and things like that, where you wanna try to figure out you know, contact tracing sides of things. Um, being able to pull in data on premise to run it through some of the, the, the training sets to, to maybe figure out you know, wh where people are traveling, what, what is the big advantage? The, the challenge is that uh, for data scientists and folks, if they wanna do processing on premise, they have to bring the data back on prem. And you know, some of these researchers that I've talked to uh, wanna keep that data in an S3 format from cloud to on premise. And so there is this need, there is this transition where people are like, if I'm gonna pull the data back down, I'd like to keep it this, in, a, in the same format all the way through. Uh, it would be really interesting to replicate a, a given bucket from the cloud to on-premise. So I have a copy of this. The challenge though with object storage is that, you know, the, the massive advantage in the cloud is that you've got data centers full of S3 object storage or uh, the various uh, S3 compliant object storage capabilities at these cloud providers. When you bring that same type of uh, resiliency and architecture to on-premise architectures, what you lose is the performance. And so this is one of the challenges that people are really struggling with is, you know, so they, they have the data in the cloud, they transition it to maybe NFS or a parallel file system to try and do the processing. But what if there was a way to do this where your on-premise on S3 object store could deliver hundreds of gigabytes per second? You know, this is what is really game changing with some of the innovation that's out there. Uh, an object storage capability that has drastically lower latency than what anybody's ever been used to in an object storage that also delivers tens of, of gigabytes per second, maybe even into a hundreds of gigabytes per second of throughput, this is game changing. And this may very well be the future of what people want as the, the next generation file system or object storage capability for feeding these GPUs. I, I think there's some inherent advantages uh, for people that want to isolate data sets and you can divvy this up in, in separate buckets. Um, you know, I think, I think you're going to see this trend uh, over time become more and more interesting for folks. Um, and, and the reverse side of this is as you have applications that may collect data at the edge or in, you know, it, particularly in the federal space, uh, as the next generation of applications for collecting uh, have the ability to write data out as objects, uh, you might see custom metadata tagging as the data is being generated, uh, take, take hold and have significant advantages. Thanks guys, you know, to tie it back to one of the earlier slides we had where we we're trying to enable that parallelism that the, you know, the feed the beast thing of these GPUs and this high performance data at the top of the funnel. You know, we really showed you some examples how we're leveraging the parallel GPUs with the parallel network connections to get parallel storage to make that funnel at the bottom much wider. So we want to move that from that serialized data gather to more of a parallel data gather and parallel data write. Well, in summary, there are many ways to address this hyper parallel data access, whether that comes from external file systems like Spectrum Scale, like Luster, or like BGFS, whether that's network file systems based on NFS, or whether that's direct attached storage, uh, or whether that's object storage. You know, there's pros and cons to each one of them. And there really is no the answer or the right answer. But I can tell you this, one of the right answers could be that if there was a system that could enable all of these or be the foundation for all of these with best in class performance, rather, you know, best in class performance to enable block storage, to enable those GPFS file systems or spectrum scale and luster and uh, you know the BGFS or a very high performance NFS file system or a very high performance S3 file systems or the ability to leverage block storage to a single storage or server like a, a DGX for super high performance with ultra low latency. You know, I think as we of course, you know, come from Pavilion, I think we have a solution for that, right? And I think we've seen that we can provide some solutions that enable every one of those 
literally out of a single platform. You know, of course, there's solutions that address that flexibility, you know, and that's where our pavilion hyper parallel all flash array comes out. Earlier on, Jim said we have to scale out storage like we're scale out the GPUs and the applications. So instead of dual controller architectures like what the typical storage array has out there today, we need multi-controller hyper parallel architectures that can scale horizontally, not just in capacity, but scale in IOPS and throughput. As you need more IOPS and throughput, you add more controllers to get that consistent, linear, consistent, low latency performance. And so whether that is for a parallel file system, whether that's an NFS system, whether that's direct attached storage, leveraging you know, the NVMe over fabric or object storage, you know, I think there's a, the pavilion has got solutions in the market that can really enable that. And with that, uh, Keith, you know, we have a very large, uh, you know, government agency that runs a very, very large spectrum scale environment. Can you give us a little color on the magnitude and scope of that solution that leverages the pavilion hyper parallel all flash array? Sure, Costa. If you think about it, you know, in a single rack of infrastructure, we can do uh, a, a thousand gigabytes per second of read. But what's really interesting is the write performance. And we could deliver 700 gigabytes per second of write performance for a parallel file system. I think that's pretty awesome. I think there's another solution, Keith, that uh, one of our partners and customers was using a large uh, uh, DGX system with direct attached storage with one of these new modern GPU based databases. Can you give us some color on how they are looking at moving from direct attached storage and leveraging NVMe over fabric to share the storage in that solution. Absolutely. Um, they're, they're really challenged with the size and scale of the data. So they're starting out with maybe a year's worth of data and they want to expand that so that they can process against larger and larger data sets. And that's scaling into hundreds of gigabytes of capacity. And that, that equates to scaling up, equates to years of data so going from one year of data to 10 years of historical data that they can analyze against. And you know, these technologies are enabling that hyper parallelism. And one of our customers told us that Pavilion makes the impossible possible. And that's that thing to do massive scalability. So to match industry leading performance density that the NVIDIA solutions enable, it requires an industry leading compute density workloads enabled by Pavilion. Remember, we've talked in this presentation about external file systems. Those external file systems leverage block storage, by the way, in a storage array. Whether that's an NFS solution, or whether that is the ability to do a shared storage, block storage to individual DGX or in, uh, NVIDIA powered uh, servers. In other words, our solution from Pavilion supports block, file, or object with class leading density. A single box will deliver, will, will allow you to connect to an external file system, leverage an NVMe or fabric, run its own file system, which Keith the talked about with NFS, or access an object, or any combination of those, whether that's InfiniBand or Ethernet. So in those four rack units, when I talk about performance density, we're talking about 20 independent controllers, all operating independently each other, delivering 20 million IOPS with over a petabyte of usable capacity and 40 100 gig ethernet ports. So the result in a single unit, 20 million IOPS read, 5 million write IOPS, 120 gigabytes a second read, and 90 gigabytes a second write at ultra low latencies. 25 microsecond write latency, in a hundred microsecond read latency. Okay, that sounds great from a storage thing, but what does that mean to an overall hyper parallel GPU enabled uh, overall ecosystem solution? Well, you consolidate that together in one single data center rack, we can deliver 1.2 terabyte per second read and 900 gigabytes, almost a terabyte a second, right? With 200 independent controllers and 200 million IOPS in one rack. So the days of very, very large 
huge systems to deliver that throughput. We're talking, excuse me, racks and racks of spinning disks and arrays to deliver that over a terabyte a second read in one rack. That's pavilion data. Thank you for your time today on behalf of me, Kostas Apopoulos, Keith Ober, and Jim Brennan. We appreciate the opportunity to, to share a little bit about a pavilion and hopefully more about how storage in the future cannot be the bottleneck in these systems and solutions. Thank you.